Hi, I'm Derek, and this is DC to Daylight. In this video, we're going to take a look at oscillators, the kind that make sine waves. And being that there are dozens of different methods to create a sine wave using analog circuitry, I've chosen to focus on what's called a Culpitz oscillator. The reason that I'm using this topology is that it uses a tank circuit to determine the oscillator's frequency, which we've covered in a previous video. Click up there for the link. And in our case, we'll use a common emitter transistor amplifier, which I think is probably more commonplace in textbooks and online references than most other configurations. In that way, if you need additional background info, it wouldn't be too difficult to find. Of course, should you need additional assistance or just want to discuss today's topic, you're always welcome to engage with myself in the comments section or in the Element 14 community. The link is in the description. Now, the goal of this video is to familiarize you with the general concepts in building an oscillator that works reliably and to give some practical equations and tips when selecting components. Now, speaking of equations, unfortunately, we can't escape the math on this one, but don't run away screaming just yet. We're going to stick to the formulas that are required to make this thing work. No fancy derivations or proofs, just the meat and potatoes. Well, enough chit chat, let's get started. We can think of our system as a kind of spring, so it wants to oscillate at a particular frequency naturally. And if I impart some energy into it, it will oscillate at that frequency and eventually dampen out. If I want to keep that oscillation going, I have to feed energy back into the system at a certain amplitude and in phase with that system that's already oscillating. So those are two criteria that I need to maintain in order to keep that oscillation going. If I do it out of phase, eventually the oscillation will stop or cancel altogether. These two criteria were defined by German physicist Heinrich Barkhausen in 1921. We'll see that the positive feedback is easy to achieve by stealing some energy from our tank circuit and amplification is provided by a single transistor. In fact, we need to provide amplification greater than or equal to one and the circuit will self-stabilize. Here's a diagram that depicts exactly what we're talking about. We have this little triangle here which represents our amplifier and then we have this block down below that represents our tank circuit. This provides the phase shift as well as the frequency at which the whole system resonates at. All right, so here is a schematic view of what we're going to build today. We have, like we said, to satisfy our Barkhausen criteria stuff, we have an amplifier that's gonna provide gain, and we have uh, this LC network, which is a tank circuit. So we have two resistors that provide a voltage bias at the base. We have an emitter resistor which, which sets the current through this leg of the transistor. And of course, our LC tank circuit, the values of those will determine the resonant frequency. We'll get more into that. And uh, we feed back that, that signal back into the base. The ratio of the collector resistor and the emitter resistor are actually what set our gain. Uh, but we're gonna do a fancy thing and bypass this guy so that uh, we use the internal resistance of the transistor to set the gain and we'll get into that, okay? So let's look at each portion of this circuit individually and then we'll look at the final uh, circuit and uh, see how it performs. Starting just from the transistor circuit itself, I have some constraints. We have 12 volts as our supply voltage, which I think everybody has on their bench, hopefully. And uh, we have this ratio of resistors here that set the voltage at the base. We can use the voltage divider formula to figure out what that voltage is going to be. Now that sets up a voltage at the emitter. Using Ohm's law, we can figure out what our uh, emitter and collector current are going to be just based off of this one resistor. So we'll get into that. I've chosen the emitter resistor to be larger than the collector, which will decrease our gain below one a little bit. And I'm gonna show you why that is, okay? Anyway, let's move on to some calculations. So I've arbitrarily chosen a value of one milliamp that I wanna drive through this leg of the transistor, the collector and emitter, okay? So I've kind of already played around with these values to determine what uh, voltages I need to produce one milliamp across this 1.2K resistor. I'm using the voltage divider formula, which says uh, voltage at my base is equal to R2 divided by the sum of R1 plus R2 times our supply voltage that's feeding it. That turns out to be 1.5K over 8.2K plus 1.5K times that 12 volts leaves us with 1.86 volts directly at the base. We do lose 0.7 volts from base to emitter like a regular diode because of the barrier potential. Okay, so that needs to be subtracted from what we calculated for our base voltage. So voltage at the emitter is base voltage minus 0.7 volts. That turns out to be 1.16 volts right here at the emitter or across the emitter resistor. Using Ohm's law, we can uh, determine the current by uh, saying current at the emitter is equal to voltage divided by resistance. 
that becomes 1.16 volts divided by 1.2 kilo ohms and that is 960 microamps and from here on out I'm going to say that's close enough to 1 milliamp okay and we'll just call it that so that sets up the bias conditions the DC quiescent uh, operating point uh, under DC it's not exactly in the center of the transistor's load line but it's good enough for the oscillator that we're building today uh, so now we're going to look at the gain of the amplifier. Barkhausen says that our gain needs to be greater than or equal to 1. So just with the DC conditions that we just looked at, the voltage gain is equal to the ratio of these two resistors, okay? The collector resistor and the emitter resistor. I have 1K over 1.2K, which gives me a gain of 0.83. Now, if I were to connect my tank circuit and everything to this, it would not oscillate because we are not greater than or equal to 1 for our gain. But we're going to do a little trick. Um, with uh, common emitter amplifiers, we can bypass, using a capacitor, the emitter resistor. And what that's going to do, this looks like a short circuit to AC signals. DC, this is a blocking capacitor, right? So it's just as if it's not even there. But for AC, it looks like a short to ground. That's going to change our voltage gain. Now, because that resistor is effectively not here, as far as AC is concerned, we still have an AC internal resistance uh, within this base emitter junction of the transistor. That's called R prime E. Now R prime E is the thermal voltage, which is 26 millivolts divided by the emitter current. This thermal voltage comes from uh, any PN silicon junction has the electrons are wiggling around inside the substrate. And that actually produces a voltage without you know, any external stimulation just on its own. And through some fancy math and physics that I'm not gonna go in today, that value is 26 millivolts at room temperature divided by the emitter current, okay? So we do that formula, 26 divided by 1, turns out to be 26 ohms of resistance uh, for the AC signal inside of this guy. We plug that back in, and our gain then turns into that ratio of the collector versus the internal AC resistance. Okay, that becomes 1K divided by 26 ohms, and we now have a gain of 38.5. So our gain is greater than 1, okay? And it should oscillate, except we're not providing any feedback yet, but we're getting to that. Let's move on to the next section. Now we did a previous video on tank circuits and that is basically an LC oscillator, which we have here. What's unique about this is you'll see that we have two capacitors that are split. And what that allows us to do is set a ratio of um, the amount of voltage that we're feeding back to the base, okay? But for all intents and purposes, let's just look at them and combine these two capacitors as if they're one. So resonant frequency is equal to one over two pi the square root of L times C. Now, like I just said, we're going to have to calculate these two capacitors in series, all right? They don't add up. In fact, it's a little more complicated than that. So we need to use one of two formulas. We can find the total capacitance here by doing the product over the sum of the two values, or we can use the one over one over rule, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and use the product over sum formula. The result will be pretty much the same, depending on rounding. So the total capacitance is 4.7 nanofarads times 47 nanofarads, over 4.7 plus 47 and that turns out to be 4.27 nanofarads okay so that value can be plugged back into our formula 1 over 2 pi the square root of 1 millihenry times the capacitance we just calculated comes out to 77 kilohertz so when we first initially turn on the power supply this is going to provide a little pulse of energy to our circuit and it's going to start oscillating actually it kind of gradually increases now let's move on and see what happens when you know we connect everything together so let's imagine that we have a signal coming into the base of the transistor that has a positive going edge. A common emitter amplifier will invert it by 180 degrees at the collector. That's getting fed through this capacitor into the tank circuit. So we're energizing this tank circuit, like hitting it with a stick, making it resonate, right? Now the nature of an LC tank circuit at resonance will invert the signal again on the other end. So we feed this signal back into the base in phase. So there's actually a 360 degree phase shift, which is the same as saying zero. Now, what about the ratio of these two capacitors? Well, that comes into play, okay? That affects our overall gain. Let's look at the ratio of these. So I have a 10 to one ratio, 4.7 nanofarads to 47 nanofarads. The feedback ratio that gets fed back to the base is equal to C1 over C2 or 4.7 nanofarads divided by 47 nanofarads. That comes out to 0.1, right? So 10% of that energy we're feeding back in. You can play with the values of these capacitors. You can actually make them equal to one by saying 47 nanofarads over 47. 
and it should still oscillate. But you might have to play with those values a little bit, depending on what it does to the gain, which we'll look at down here. So our gain of this amplifier is now our resistor in our collector resistor multiplied by the inverse of R prime E, which we said was 26, 26 or 27 ohms, right? Um, and that's actually called the conductance. Collector resistor times the conductance times our feedback ratio. Our voltage gain is now 1K times 1 over 27 times 0.1. And now the overall gain of this closed loop positive feedback system becomes 3.7. So we're satisfying Barkhausen and we have an amplifier that should amplify. We have a tank circuit that should oscillate at the frequency we want or close to it. I've already got it here on the breadboard. So let's uh, connect some power to this, right? 12 volts. And then we'll monitor uh, the signal at the output of the tank, the high side of the tank. Here's our transistor that's acting as our amplifier. We have our two resistors here that form the uh, DC bias voltage on the base. And then we have our emitter resistor, our emitter bypass capacitor. And I didn't talk about these two block DC blocking capacitors right here. So all this does is it keeps DC separate from the amplifier circuit and the tank circuit. I don't want any DC voltage in the tank circuit because it could potentially mess things up. And we have our collector resistor here. These two set our gain. And of course we have our inductor and our two capacitors here. So what I'm gonna do is connect my oscilloscope probe to the output of the tank circuit. In fact, what I'm gonna do is connect a second probe so that we can see the uh, signal at the base of the transistor, which should be 180 degrees out of phase. And we'll take a look at both of those. All right, let's turn the scope on. All right, let's turn on channel one. And you can see uh, it kind of resembles a sine wave, okay? And it looks like our frequency is, I can't really see that. It looks like 86 kilohertz. So we're almost 10 kilohertz off from our uh, frequency that we calculated. Part of it is uh, component tolerance. The inductor and capacitor have their own tolerance ranges, but that's a pretty big change. Um, and I think most of it is due to the breadboard itself. So there are a lot of parasitic capacitance and inductance on the board, and that can cause your frequency to shift. Now, when you're building an oscillator, um, outside of audio frequencies, getting up into ultrasonic and certainly RF, you want to build it with a ground plane, okay? Point-to-point -point contact with the components as close to each other as possible so that you don't get frequency shifts like this. Now, the strange waveform that you're looking at here is, you know, most likely due to R1 and R2 in the DC bias portion of the uh, circuit that we built. Uh, and the reason is I use low value resistors and that's actually the load. Those two resistors in parallel present a load to the tank circuit. So I'm probably asymmetrically loading down that tank circuit. So when you're doing this, you can play around with the values, scale them up, scale them down and uh, see how that affects the loading here. A common amplifier has this kind of characteristic. Now, normally you'd use like a common base uh, BJT amplifier, but I didn't want to cover that because it's not as common in the textbooks. Uh, let's go ahead and look at channel two, which is our feedback. You can see that that's perfectly 180 degrees out of phase with the collector of the transistor. All right, well, that wraps up today's video. I hope that the theory that we covered today and, you know, breadboarding the circuit, looking at the waveforms and all of that helps you kind of uh, understand a little bit more about the LC oscillator and how to go about building one. And, uh, you know, I find that when I, I see other people building things that are a little more complicated and outside of my wheelhouse, it gives me the confidence to go ahead and try it myself. So I hope that did the same for you. Um, if you have some tips on oscillators, I'm not a 100% expert on this stuff. Uh, but uh, I know enough to be dangerous. I'm glad that I could share that with you today But uh, if you have some comments or suggestions hit me up down in the comments below or contact me through the element 14 community Element14.com links are in the description and I will see you next time. Have a good one